Hello everyone. So on behalf of all the organizing institutions, Friend in Need India Trust, United Nations University and Engineers Without Borders Ireland, I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you. I'd also like to take uh, the time to thank the organizer of this event, uh, Akshita Kapoor, who has worked very hard to get everything on time and who has made all these lovely slides and banners. And uh, Ms. Prachi Kumar, okay, who is actually doing her uh, dissertation on violence against women and the role of technology at the United Nations University UNU Merit and who has kindly agreed to be our moderator for the day. Now, she has asked me to introduce myself, so I will run through that. Basically, um, I, I wear two hats. I'm a professor of technology and innovation and development. First, I started looking at the high tech, but then after the tsunami, when I founded an NGO, I started looking at low tech and more seriously at how economic theory and all that I had learned could be deployed to make the world a better place. It was not at all clear in the beginning, but this led me to also expand my methodology and become a transdisciplinary scholar. And uh, I am happy to report that academics is indeed useful as, uh, as an expertise, you know, ac academic experience to make the world a better place. And I invite all academics and students to also uh, join me. Now, over to you, Prachi. It's nice to meet you, everybody, and thank you for the introduction, Professor Ramani. Um, we're here today on the International Day of Women and Girls in Science. And uh, I wanted to dive a little bit deeper into the history, why we have this day today, how did it come about? And while a lot of uh, the UN days and a lot of focus on uh, even uh, gender days has been there for 20, 30, 40 years, when it comes to the International Day of Women and Girls in Science, it was only 10 years ago that the Commission for uh, the Status of Women, the 55th Commission, uh, adopted this uh, report, which spoke about the status of women and girls in science, the access that they have to resources, and also their participation in education and technology. And only in this was only in 2011, 10 years ago. And in 2013, this was also something that the United Nations General Assembly, the UNGA, uh, noted that this is something that should be a priority. And they uh, affirmed their need for full and equal participation and access to science, technology and innovation for everybody, especially women and girls. Um, it was about six years, it's seven years ago now in 2015 that they started this day, that it was observed as a UN official UND and today on the 11th of Feb, we commemorate and uh, champion all our friends and women and girls in science. So uh, welcome everybody today um, and thank you for being here. Uh, even though we've done a lot in the last 10 years and we see in this room right now that there's quite a few women and women in science and girls in science with us, we still face a number of challenges. And one of those particularly difficult challenges is ability stereotypes. So it's the, how we feel about our own abilities as mathematicians, scientists, innovators, and also how the world sees us. Um, sometimes we see peace, peace discrimination based on our abilities in these, uh, in these domains but also about representation. If there are not enough leaders in women in science, everybody suffers. Um, we need to see these leaders in, uh, by ourselves to be able to uh, limit the impact of discriminatory norms, which is another problem that we continue to face. Uh, when it comes to pay parity and career progression, there's been, again, little progress. Um, it's hard for women to break into leadership roles in STEM because it still continues to be a male-dominated space. And even access to resources, whether to do scientific research or grants or to be able to reach a level of, uh, of uh, knowledge in science takes access to universities and schooling as well, even if there's passion and interest. So with all of these issues, we uh, put the spotlight on them today and we... Uh, talk about something um, quite 
at the intersection of all of that. That is, in these male-dominated and male-designed settings, the sexual and reproductive health and rights of women can sometimes be undermined, um, particularly in STEM institutes and in social studies and education establishments. So today, our topic is that we discuss what these challenges mean for us, what are the common obstructors for women and girls and people who menstruate everywhere, how can these be addressed? And secondly, what is the role of awareness building, of technology, of new practices in ending these issues that we face, including period poverty, including sexual reproductive health and rights, among others? So I invite and welcome our esteemed speakers today. And uh, before we begin, I have a question to our audience members, to our participants. What do we know about period poverty? So if you want to give me a little, what do we think about period poverty? Thanks. You can unmute yourself. Don't have to raise your hands. Um, would you like to go to the gym today? Do legs. Now skip. Hi, there was somebody working on period poverty. Maybe think... they can they can answer, and then I would like to hear about it. Tandy, how about you? What do you have you been you've been researching period poverty in your master thesis, right? Yes, um, I view period poverty as just the life circumstances that happen after you're not able to access sanitary products or access safe sanitation um, areas. So this could be in schools or just in your day-to-day -day life. So how does this impact um, your future, for example? If you, if you haven't had good practices of sanitation when it comes to your monthly period, and how does that spill over to other effects in your life? Absolutely. So a right as always, we have a big problem and that is of access so to resources, affordability of period products because of the taxes and because the typical period pro products available in the market can be too expensive for everybody. The second is menstrual crisis. It's a big crisis because there's not enough information and not enough resources, not just in terms of the sanitary products, but especially toilets. And I'm sure Professor Ramani can talk a lot about this as well. Uh, so I won't go into detail. And then the absence and support of families, as well as the lack of knowledge about managing periods. And finally, like Tanti said, it has extreme consequences for the dignity and rights of girls everywhere, whether it comes to their uh, future uh, progress, whether in their uh, working life, whether in their education, whether in their full and uh, equal participation in all spheres of life, in their dignity, and very importantly, in their health as well. So a little bit about period poverty before we move on to our esteemed speakers. We thank all of you for being here today. And uh, we look forward to the exciting conversation that's going to emerge from all of this. Um, without further ado, I welcome uh, Annie, Anna and Zaimi to uh, share with us what they have uh, in store. Anna is, and Saimi are both students at the at Master University and UWC and they work as interns with Finn. Um, they're both passionate about sustainability and creating a difference uh, in developing countries. So... Um, Anna and Saimi, it's all yours. Would you like to share your screen? Your... Hello. Uh, so, wait, wait um, my screen sharing is not working right now. It says that you can't start screen share while the other wow. participant is sharing. Yeah. You should be able to do it now, Saimi. Sorry, just a second. Okay, I'm going to, I, I asked Prati, you know, to ask me a question, but I'm going to tell you this. I'm, I'm going to tell you the story while they are uh, catching up of why I organized this. I said, Prachi asked me, but it's okay. So I want to tell you my story. Uh, the thing is, when I was young, I actually looked forward to periods, okay, because it meant 
that I could chill. Okay. My mom won't give me any work. When he got periods in India, it was a day of celebration. So I asked my, my mother said, what do you want? I said, a cycle, an adult one. That day itself, my dad had to teach me how to cycle. And then on the days of the periods, we just chilled. We, we didn't have to do any housework. We could order everyone around. So I used to read my romantic books. My sister at her time read all the murder mysteries. My sister is out here. She can remember that. And then my mother, of course, went for the classics, which neither of us touched. She's still reading them. So <laughs> then at school, it was another story. And uh, the toilets were so yucky. We just didn't go to school. Who wants to go to school? I didn't want to go to school. So it was a dumb thing that because of yucky toilets, you didn't have to go to school. In college, it was slightly better because uh, basically I could go to a lecturer's house because she, which was a student of my dad. And uh, so it was always a major problem where to change, how to change, what to do. But at least I had no hassles. And uh, whereas there are many other women in my family who are having, uh, having a lot of pain, having a lot of issues. And so I, I, I thought things would have changed till I started getting my own doctoral students telling me, Professor Romani, I cannot Zoom with you today. I'm just having, I'm just in such a bad state. I can't do it. I said, oh my God, still. So I wanted to know how the world had changed since my time, whether it's still the same or whether it's different, whether we are thinking differently and uh, how is the world treating us? So this is this is out of this curiosity question. I, I put this and uh, now I hope the slides are ready. <laughs> OK, over yes. to you. <laughs> they're from school, so let's give them a big hand because they're both in their high school. You know, they they agreed to do this very sensitive survey. Please go ahead. Thank you. So, can you see it now? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, so, uh, we're going to be talking about the impact of menstruation on academic performance of high school students. And we're going to be focusing on our own school, which is UOVC Maastricht, so United World College Maastricht here in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. um, the brief introduction of us. Uh, my name is Anna Matsuzawa, and I'm 70 years old. And I'm originally from Japan, but I came to Maastricht uh, last September and I'm going to UWC Maastricht. So I'm living in Maastricht and I'm studying right now. Hello, I'm Sami Hartikainen. I'm also 17 years old. Uh, I'm from Finland and I'm also here in Maastricht where we're both studying at UWC Maastricht. So, um, the, we have the survey, and uh, basically it's mostly about in, uh, experiences on menstruation. And uh, since we sent it to students of our school, here you can see um, the answers that we got from the first question, which, which was about the age and the age at which students started their periods. Um, so as you can see, the students are mostly from um, 16 to 18, but there are some 14, 15 and 19 year old students as well. And on the other side, you can see um, at the, the age that at which students started their administration. Um, and mostly it is at 12, 13, but it is a very uh, wide range of ages. Um, and the interesting fact about this survey is that our school is uh, both um, visited, our school has both residential students and also day students. So uh, the, the people who are experiencing menstruation is like have different um, aspect of like um, how they yeah how they experience it and how they uh, like uh, dealing with their um, symptoms. Yeah. So that's the interesting fact of our survey. Yeah, uh, and since most of the students who answered are from like sixteen to eighteen, this would mean that uh, they're like DP students, so they're like upper secondary school, and most of these students are or a lot of these students are residential students. Yes. 
Um, here we can see some of the, the um, symptoms that people are experiencing while they're on their periods. And as you can imagine, and also probably from your own experience can tell, that these kind of symptoms are um, have a really broad impact on your daily lives, if, especially if you experience these, let's say, five days a uh, month. And these um, symptoms can uh, affect your social life, your academic life, your just uh, internal well-being and your physical health. So these symptoms really have really broad impact. Yeah, and as you can see from this, as, um, uh, the people who answered none is really, really short on other people. And so that most of the people are suffering or like experiencing some sort of symptoms during their periods. Yeah. Um, and here we can see um, the percentage of students who answer that they have experienced PMS. And PMS would be defined as, um, so the, it is short, short, shortened from uh, premenstrual syndrome. And it's a condition that affects um, a person's emotions, physical health and behavior during certain days of a menstrual cycle, uh, usually just before their period. And this is something like the definition is very broad, but that's because um, different people experience PMS in very different ways. And this we can see um, from uh, the different symptoms that people have. They're very different and they also have a very broad effect on a person's life. Yeah, so uh, many people are suffering not only five, five to seven days in a, in a month, but also like more than a week they are suffering from their symptoms. Um, emotional, uh, emotionally or physically, they're experiencing their Yes, which is really um, influencing their kind of life. Mm -hmm. And here we can uh, see that many people said that PMS and or period symptoms have a negative effect on their academic performance. Uh, but in this question, it is also like we need to consider the fact that it, it can be very hard for people to identify whether their PMS and period symptoms have had an, like an impact on their academic performance. Um, but generally speaking, a lot of people um, have identified this issue and that is something that we really want to highlight and um, uh, talk more about. Yes. yes. And here are some things that people said that um, PMS or period symptoms are affecting in their academic performance. Mm. Mostly, like uh, people are um, unmotivated to their to do their schoolwork or going to class, and especially like going to they, they can go to class, but it's really difficult focusing on classes. And if you skip skip or like could not cannot focusing on one class, they might they have to like. Um, studied by themselves individually after the classes, like after the, they're experiencing um, symptoms. So which means it lets a really difficult time for the students. And um, yeah, this is why um, people are really having a different time during their periods. Yeah. Um, and um, then we started thinking of solutions for these issues. So for example, um, like something that is very broadly discussed when talking about like things that the school could do in regards to periods is that the school could provide students with sanitary products. And this is something that, for example, um, Ken Fight, which is a, like a feminist uh, initiative at our school has proposed and started like, um, uh, also a survey and then like asking if student, students would like the school to provide them with sanitary products and they brought this initiative to the school but so far um, we still haven't gotten any results but this as you can see from the results many people do consider getting um, sanitary products from the school as something that would really help their their life. And from this slide, uh, we can see that many people are thinking that schools can help them um, in their schools. At the same time, you can see that many people agree with being provided free sanitary products rather than um, being provided of a or a dedication. Um, and we thought that this is uh, the reason behind it is that many people know that if they skip or if they ask extension for assignments, they know that they have to work 
more than they 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 um were assigned because they have to work themselves and it's really difficult to do the do the classes by themselves. So many people are acknowledged not like not know that it's difficult, but the free sanitary, sanitary products is something that schools can do and you don't have to sacrifice it. So this is the one of the solutions that we can come up and the, um make an action as yeah, and we think that periods shouldn't be something that limits a person's ability to just go to school. And we think that the school should make sure that when someone has their menstruation, uh, they feel comfortable and safe and um, like hygienic to come to school, and uh, and that they're still like able to participate in the education and in lessons like in almost the same way as they could like normally. Uh, here is uh, a few thoughts that um, students had about um, like how the school could help uh, menstruating students, and you can you can uh, obviously read them yourself. But um, what we really want to highlight would be just, um, the first comment. I think yeah. we should also be providing more medical rights, like the bathroom, going to bathroom more frequently, providing pills in our food corners. And good enough, or like, yeah, those kind of small things, small changes, not like the big or like uh, the things to take cost or something. So like teachers or the class in, in class, um, people can be pro provided um, small, small like um, support from the teachers and other people, and that understanding would be helpful to those students. Yeah, understanding is something that doesn't really re uh, like require many resources from the school. It's just something that when people get more educated about periods, they feel more empathetic uh, towards people who are experiencing menstruation, and this can really help one in um, in like an emotional emotionally hard time. Um, and then some comments from students how they feel about having their periods. Um, it, it was um, like only a few, we got a lot of results and a lot of answers, but we picked a few and we tried to pick like many different kinds of answers. So what we can see here is that, um, for example, that period, like one period is not a big thing, but then PMS is much more of a bigger impact uh, than some people like acknowledge that it's not very nice to get your period, but they feel very privileged that they have it uh, or that they're like able to able to get it and um and also especially the fact that like even though we do have problems about menstruation at the school we still are in a very clean and safe environment to talk about it and to experience it uh which is something that not everyone gets to exp uh, experience and um we need to be grateful for that as well and also we can see that um there is a like a, we have a lot of students from different cultures in the school so like um uh, the way people feel about it uh, can also depend on that. Mm. And here are some, some more comments on how students feel about the periods. And yeah, as you can see, someone is uh, highlighting the fact that it affects their school performance. Uh, here's a quick summary of the results of the survey. Uh, if you like, you can take a like a screenshot or something if you weren't interested in what we discovered from this survey. Um, yes. And then here in conclusion, just our initial thoughts. Um, like what we got mostly from this would be that period should be taken more seriously. And here we have a few um, like ideas how the school can make it easier for students to menstruate. For example, educating students and staff members of all genders, um, and then like making uh, life a bit easier for students to menstruate. For example, letting people go to the bathroom during lessons more easily because that's that's something that's really minor, but it's something that can really make a difference. Um, and like giving a place where to relax during breaks and yeah. yeah making a some system to like relax or being ha having us in place to um to, like chill uh and being not like un feeling un 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 uncomfortable but being comfortable with their not appearance being understood by other people is the way that's a good person. 
Yeah. Yes. And then just, just at the end, we just wanted to highlight the fact that our, like, we are really privileged to have all these um, sanitary facilities at the school. And mostly the, the problems that we have are more related to like interpersonal feelings of, um, for example, shame or just being uncomfortable and not feeling comfortable to, um, for example, ask to leave the classroom, to go to the bathroom or things such, such as that. And that is something we can easily fix if we uh, take action. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for listening. <laughs> it, was a, it was a great pleasure to be here and talk, talk to you about this. Uh, it was very good. Um, Prachi, may I have a word? Because these girls said that they are they have to leave. Of uh, course. So I I was curious, girls, about two things. Can you please show your conclusion side again? Yes. Because you come from a, uh, I mean, your school is a very uh, good school, very, yes. very good school. I cannot imagine anybody having any financial difficulty in getting sanitary napkins, the conclusion one. And yet uh, you put that everybody would like some free stuff. Now, is it the question of free or is there really a problem? Uh, OK, it was in the conclusion and um, okay, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You can just listen. That is one question. The second question is you had put that you mustn't take these sanitary facilities for granted. So I was curious about that. What is your responsibility as students to, to also participate in the maintenance of sanitary facilities? Okay. Uh, so to the, the first question, uh, about the um, financial assistance. Uh, our school has a very wide range of students and because it's a ULBC school, uh, the aim of ULBC is to bring together people from different socioeconomic backgrounds. So we have a lot of students with scholarships here uh, and that that not everyone has um, like uh, all the resources to uh, access these things. Mm. And also, uh, including financial assistance, it's not only about that. It's also about, for example, the feelings of shame. So if, if let's say, we had, yeah, yeah, if we had like um, sanitary products in a girl's bathroom, that could make it easier for girls to like break the taboo and also just um, like more comfortable to go to the bathroom and not having to carry them, for example, in their hands. Go there, yes. But yeah, the financial assistance, it, it doesn't, it doesn't apply to everyone. But we do have students who come from like very, very um, uh, socioeconomic, like uh, different different socioeconomic backgrounds because we have a lot of scholarship students. Yeah, so, and yes. also I think um, not only like uh, generally there are affordable food guides and stuff like that. Some people might think that um, it is not fair to I can't. girls or like the, the people who have menstruation have to buy center products, but not like uh, what generally men doesn't have to buy those things. So like people might think that there's an inequality of economics, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and then so that people, even though the, the people can afford buying those products, think that um, people should buy those products. Because many people, um, but all the well, women um, were experiencing menstruation and that's something that um, the like it can create like kind of like a question about gender equality as well that like not everyone has to purchase them but some <laughs> uh yeah it's a, it's a very discussed and debatable topic but we just asked this because it's it's definitely something that the school um or like in the school students bring up often that we should be provided with free sanitary products and um even though we're not like a hundred percent sure that would be the right um it is something to consider and um, it's something that many students bring up often. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Thomas, I see you have your hand raised. Uh, yes, absolutely. I would also like to join uh, in, in thanking you guys for sharing this this very nice data with us. Uh, I had a follow up question, uh, and I think you've made a very comprehensive point on the sanitary products themselves. 
But a problem that is often reported mostly in uh, in low and middle income countries is the lack of education and a lack of awareness on the issues surrounding menstruation. And I wanted to ask you uh, how or, or how much did you know uh, as students about menstruation and whom did you learn it for? And to expand the debate, whether you think uh, these topics should be touched upon in school. Uh, well, I go first. Uh, I personally, uh, since I come from Finland, and in Finland we do have it at school. At schools, very like um, a wide range of different kind of health education. So uh, for me, it was something that I learned at school. And coming here, I noticed that not everyone has had the um, like haven't been able to achieve this knowledge at school or like in their own countries when where they came, came from. Um, and uh, we definitely think that this should this should be something that is discussed at school uh, to make sure that everyone has the, the knowledge that they need to make their life more comfortable and um, make sure that they are uh, doing things like hygienically and um, like in a healthy way. Um, and yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, I definitely agree with Saini. And my personal experience is that I come, I personally come from girls only school in Japan. So like I really kind of educated about menstruation because um, we don't really have about, about that because there's only girls and we all we all experience in periods. So that's common things that we talk about. Like if I was suffering from symptoms, I can talk. I have headache. Or Um, so make it something like that and people can understand and the teacher is a really understandable um, people so that was a really um, good environment that I can um, be and coming here um, there's a lot of like it was my first time spending some sort of spending time with um, boys or other gender people and sometimes it's really difficult to talk about that but at the same time I um, got to know that some boys or like the people who don't have menstruation are also understanding about periods and some people are caring about um, those symptoms. So, um, but at the same time, um, some people might not know about that, but in this environment, people are, are um, taken seriously mm -hmm. more than I thought. So, but um, still we need to talk about this. Um, we have to debate about this. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, what is um, like a really big thing in UWC schools is that, is that people are selected to come here and make sure that they have kind of like an open mind for different kind of discussions. So um, even if someone doesn't have that much knowledge, usually people are very open to discussions and very open to learn more. Which um, would you think that it's it's a good thing for like the community overall and also for the health of the people who menstruate? Um, to, to like make sure that the, the environment at, at the school is safe and that uh, topics such as this can be discussed, even if not everyone has that much knowledge on it. Yeah. All Thank right. You. Thanks for your question. And thank you very, very much, Anna and Saimi, for coming in today and for sharing this excellent survey with us. You really put into focus uh, an unmet need that women and girls face everywhere and, uh, of course, all menstruators, uh, menstruators face in schools. And that unmet need isn't just sanitary products. It's also to do with uh, how we practice our menstrual hygiene and how we are perceived in schools, our emotional state and our uh, physical health as well. So um, thanks very much for coming in today. And uh, we'd like to now invite... Um, Ms. Akshita Kapoor, who is uh, a bachelor student at, uh, in technology and computer science at UPES in Dehradun in India, uh, and who's also uh, one of our organizing committee members. So Akshita, thanks for joining us and uh, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your introduction. Uh, I will share my screen and then I'll start. So hello all, I am Akshita Kapoor. I am a B.Tech graduate student. Today I will be talking about the technology choices of menstrual hygiene and other challenges faced by university students during periods. So to consolidate my uh, research, I conducted a survey of about 30 respondents 
among my school friends and university batchmates to start with my topic i would like to first talk about menstruation and how it is going on like from the time from our mothers how they used to have their periods and how they used to talk about it and how we are doing it so if we see that we can see there is a lot of change coming from that point of time to now because that time our mothers and sisters and elders were not allowed even to go to temples uh, kitchens household do work and was treated to be untouchables but nowadays we have <coughs> uh, have broadened our mind we are living in a society uh, i my father we talk about periods and we discuss things upon that so we can see a lot of change coming here by but we need to improve a lot and that's why this is the survey which i conducted to know more about it so as we know that period is a biological process but there is a lot of stigma and shame while talking about it still with men and other elders as well so starting with the survey our first main focus was to know how, what kind of technology people are using while menstruating so university students are like about age of 19 to 23 and they are much aware about menstruation so uh, when we uh, did the survey we see that most of the youngsters are using pads they are not using menstrual cups they are only 2% is using tampons and uh, combination of menstrual cups and pads etc so with this data we can see that people lack awareness and as we see in the market the use of menstrual cups is increasing its market is increasing people are promoting it so why we should use it and how we should use it is the main focus but along with this we should also know that if we are using menstrual cups is it safe is it good for our uh, reproductive system so with the awareness it also comes about the information regarding the product which the companies don't do that's why people are mostly using pads because it is coming from a very long time and people are using it and people are trusting the brands and the other products related to the pads with this our second main focus was talking about the challenges which are faced by the university students during their periods so most of them go through menstrual pain heavy bleeding premenstrual syndrome clots my, menstrual migraine and these are the different data like approx 50% go through heavy bleeding missing periods and premenstrual syndrome this is because of various diseases which is uh, like increasing among girls if we can see pcod pcos it's increasing and we should talk about it and engage other girls as well to know more about it so that we can even have a treatment for it because what happens is that most of us believe that we are having a pcos and we cannot fight against it we see that it is a disease which is there in our body and it is normal but we should fought, fight for it and we should treat it uh, in a way that we should not have any menstrual pain and to lead this comes our second question which was that to like uh, support our period pains and symptoms what kind of medicine and technologies people are using so the most used technology was the hot water bags and heating pads which is mainly for menstrual pains uh, while uh, menstruating people need it because uh, they want warm uh, side of effect other we can see medicines in medicines we see combi frame uh, meftal spas it's increasing in the market because uh, what we feel is that people are not trying to uh, take a longer step like by doing yoga by doing exercises people are trying to uh, neglect the fact that they are having a menstrual pain and they want to uh, neglect the pain by eating a medicine so this is the this is one uh, of the main other factors also which needs attention the doctors should talk about it that if they are eating a meftal spas that how is it safe how much we can take it how for long how we can take it so 
from the survey these were the main three questions which i wanted to talk about so that we can get attention towards it and we can talk about it and from solutions can be uh, there moving forward we also like uh, asked our uh, respondents about some facilities which they would want from the university employers government and uh, other offices for further employment and where in this case we see that better hygiene and disposable facilities should be there in university washrooms like if i uh, give an example in our schools there is a facility of sanitary uh, pads but for that we have to go to a infirmary for getting it if we are in a washroom and we don't have anybody around us then going to a infirmary and getting a sanitary pad is difficult for a girl so then comes the other suggestion from one of our respondent was that introducing pad machines in girls washroom in case of emergency when they don't have anyone around also increase of knowledge and awareness among boys and other individuals so that they can comfort the girls while they are studying with them or even they are employees with them because what happens is in schools boys don't talk about it and it is shown that it is a problem which is related to girls so girls should know about it but it should be known and it should be uh, uh, made aware with boys also so that they can give comfort to the girls then in rural areas there is lack of awareness as we know that there is period poverty so we need access to resources and facilities so there should be awareness then reduce the cost of sanitary products so the underprivileged people can afford them i found this suggestion a bit uh, different because uh, what we buy is we feel that it is for our necessity so we don't think that whether it should be costly or not but for the underprivileged they are not able to buy it they are using uh, clothes and they are getting uh, stains and they are, they are, they have no one to talk about it and if we see most of the uh, people when they get menstruation the girls at a very young age only talk about to their parents about it they don't have any friends to talk about medical professionals are there but they can't connect with them so uh, like directly and for the parents they are they have like a mindset for the underprivileged they have a mindset of old technology so they don't uh, teach their young daughters about the various technologies and how the sanitary products can be used and so they give them clothes now the cost of the sanitary products should be reduced in terms i feel is that the underprivileged should be made aware about it and they should be like given some facilities from the government so that they have be the, have the access to the sanitary pads and machines and etc now the last uh, uh, suggestion was about the period leaves i feel that uh, this suggestion is for the people who are like suffering from extreme uh, conditions when they are not able to manage work while having uh, menstruation and uh, it should also be considered in the offices and universities so uh, for the conclusion uh, some issues which i would like that needs to be discussed are talking about which technology is best to use what can be the solutions for pain and other sufferings regardless of any medicine or any other technology how we can do it naturally is medication harmful in what quantity it should be consumed in what ways and forms support can be received from government universities and offices how they can uh, support women and girls is there still need for awareness are everyone aware about it should we uh, introduce more awareness campaigns for underprivileged how we should do it and in what ways we can uh, decrease period poverty so thank you so much and uh, thank you Thank you very much Akshita this was excellent and thanks for presenting these results to us also um I this actually reminded me of something that happened at university when I was a student um and we had pad machines installed in all of the washrooms um okay. but uh, they never worked 
Okay. You know why they never worked? Because even if they were there, the university administration knew that these fat machines were there, but we didn't even talk about it. Nobody told anyone because they were too <laughs> shy to touch upon the topic of periods. And I think, yeah. Professor Ramani, you had a question about this, right? <laughs> <laughs> the, the the thing is, uh, it's more of a comment. Uh, go back to your uh, suggestions, Ankita. I just wanted to say, you see, uh, you were talking a lot about the underprivilege. Since about, uh, I think, about ten years, there is a government scheme. India is uh, one of the f- forerunners, and uh, every girl uh, in school. below the poverty line and this uh, you know about i would say 75% of the indian families are eligible you know with with these girls in schools to receive the sanitary napkins okay okay and uh, even in the in the village where we are based the thing is that lady sells them in the black it's the implementation okay. which is a problem so yeah. every time they go to her the government gives they don't know what is given so it is the uh, uh, i'm getting another comment you know but that's why we must please see the chat so it's not the lack of existence of the program but it is in the implementation and the traceability and the accountability but it is there but the machine story was even better <laughs> yeah Was it easy to talk about this with your colleagues, Akshita, or is it something that they were still a bit hesitant to talk about? Because I wonder that if any of these norms have changed over the years. Uh, ma'am, if I see, uh, say in school, when we were in school, like in sixth or seventh standard, then we hesitated even talking among girls because we used to think that like, like we are having periods and the other girl is not having, so like we have a problem. <laughs> so we didn't talk about it. but like in college uh, it is uh, much more uh, like uh, broader we can even talk to boys also they uh, they are not hesitant in talking about it but yes i feel that uh, the hesitation is more in the in terms of uh, they want to give us sympathy like you are having a period poor girl this should not be there they should empathize with us they can give us comfort they can help us in ways like if uh, they can do anything in terms of providing facilities or with the, uh, by collaborating with university but we don't need sympathy which i feel uh, should be there because uh, most of the times when in school we talk about people think that we need sympathy uh, that girls are suffering so we should uh, make them feel better but we don't need to get feel better we just need some facilities and stuff like that for sure we need we need we don't need uh, poor you oh my god you're going through your period yeah. we need help we need all of the things that we're asking for and this reminded me of something in semi and anna's uh, uh, presentation also there was a young woman who said that she feels powerful when she's on her period she feels strong and that period power is a thing and she embraces uh, this aspect of her uh, menstruation also i saw that there was a a, a hand raised um, i think it's back now did anybody have any questions for akshita well uh, i i think i have some questions but we will do it at the end sure because i think uh, uh, the next speaker also has a time constraint Sure thing. Um but I'm coming back Akshita. This is very interesting. Sure ma'am. Thank I'm you so much. Yes. Thank you Akshita. Okay. Um So oh I don't know if you can see my screen. Let me try and share again something. Ah, there we go. Sorry. Um So we've heard now some very interesting uh, observations survey data from our students at university and at school and we discussed these challenges and obstructors to um, a better menstrual hygiene management health and uh, our lives in general so now that we've discussed these challenges let us think about what is the role of awareness building technology new practices and norms that we need to adopt for our own well-being um and for that reason i invite uh, Olivia uh, to the fora Olivia is uh, is a senior service designer at Snook um she utilizes human centered design to create a positive social change and has worked with several charities and she's here with us today thank you so much for joining us Olivia 
Um, she's going to introduce an exciting new innovation called a menstrual toolkit to address period poverty. We're really grateful to have you today and uh, look forward to your thoughts. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of background and then I'm going to share some slides about the menstrual toolkit. So um, basically this started as a university project. So my background is in industrial design and we had um, some modules around design ethics. And I think one of the project topics that we came up with was designing for refugees. Um, and so we initially started thinking, OK, well, obviously refugees face an awful lot of challenges as well as kind of heightened emotions. And we started to think, well, what are the basic challenges that I face in my life that will be made even more difficult for refugees? And initially it started thinking like that, but we kind of expanded our thoughts into actually, you know, issues around menstruation and, and hygiene and, and safety to do with your period is actually kind of more widespread than just refugees. Um, and we started to think about anyone who is in period poverty. So we started off developing a menstrual toolkit um, and we did a lot of work with migrant women living in Ireland at the time. We checked in with friends to see the problems that they had. And um, we were lucky that we've actually been able to implement and test this with different charities in Nepal as well. So I guess I'll share my screen and talk through a little bit about what a menstrual toolkit is and talk to you a little bit about, um, I guess, what we've done with it. So uh, Tide is a menstrual toolkit that you can see on screen. And it's comprised of reusable, menstru uh, reusable sanitary pads, underwear with a built-in gusset so that you can attach the sanitary pads, um, infographic instructions, and a handmade washer as well. And so I'll talk a little bit about how we made each of them and then how they work together. So um, there we go. So the sanitary pad itself is made up of three main layers. Uh, the top layer is the dry layer that sits against skin. And we, saw, we found that that can be made from most knitted fabrics as it allows liquid to pass through while keeping it like feeling somewhat dry. The second layer or the middle layer is the absorbency layer. Um, and that's the layer that retains liquid and it can be made from most uh, natural materials. Um, and then the bottom layer, which should be made out of, it's, it's the leak proof layer. So it should be made out of most, I think it can be made from pretty much anything that's leak proof. Um, and somewhat breathable. And the way it's designed is that when not in use, it can be closed, but when in use, um, the, the packaging that covers it is actually how you fasten it to underwear. So that's the pad. Um, we also built a handmade washer. Uh, what so, is bamboo fleece, please, just for clarification? Yeah, so the, the um, materials that we have on screen are materials that were accessible to us in testing. But really, we realized bamboo fleece is um, hard to get your hands on pretty much everywhere. So we said originally it should be made from bamboo fleece, but can be made from cotton, flannel, hemp, microfiber, any um, natural absorbent material that people can get their hands on. So the materials mentioned at the beginning are, are useful, but actually it can be made from, from kind of a range of materials, depending what you have available. And the, and the last layer is just any plastic or can you take a plastic bag and put it? Uh, you could. We would recommend something more similar to what an umbrella is made out of or a raincoat. Okay. So it's actually okay. like a, a sheer kind of flexible plastic, I suppose. Um, and then with the handheld washing device, this essentially works as like there's an inner cage in which you put your soiled either underwear or sanitary pads. And then there's a housing um, and a top opening. So you put water into it and use it just by shaking it up and down. We've been making these with, we 3D printed them at the time because we had access to 3D printers in our university. But I'll talk a little bit more about how that's kind of moved on because 3D printing again, isn't that accessible. Um, so these are the prototypes that we made to begin with. But how it all works together is, and I don't actually have any um, pads on me today to show you. But how it works is it all comes packaged inside of um, the washer, or that's how you store it if you're using it yourself. The outer plastic layer, um, that kind of umbrella material, uh, it folds up and so it stays closed. So the part that you uh, sits against your skin is never opened or exposed when not in use. So you open it up and then with the top layer, you fold it under. And essentially in underwear, um, there's an extra layer of fabric or a gusset just kind of along the bottom that sits against your skin. And these 
that uh, the opening of the pad slides into the gusset and you can just place it then. So it stays attached by kind of basically folding into your underwear. And when not in use, there's a tab to pull it back out, close it up. And um, we even kind of went as far as designing small pockets on the front of women's underwear so that you can carry them to and from the toilet in a more discreet fashion. Um, and then when you need to clean them, you put them inside of the um, washer, fill it with water, shake it out and rinse it. And you can do that a couple of times. I think there's some, I guess I'll talk a little bit about why we made sanitary pads as opposed to looking at kind of um, reusable cups or tampons or other, other options. And I think that's because from our speaking to different people, we had a little bit of considerations we wanted to take into account. Oh, I'll talk about that in a minute. The next thing about it is, so there's the pad and there's washer and there's underwear, but we also realized it's not, I guess what we didn't want to do was to design these menstrual toolkits and just hand them out to people who needed them because there's issues with supply chains. Um, it's hard to make sure that they're getting into the hands of the people that really need them. So we started to think about how can we actually empower women to just make them themselves and, and kind of support themselves with, with what they have accessible. So we started to think it's more than just kind of having access to something on your period. It's actually about education and a built sense of community and reducing the taboo around what you can and can't do and knowing kind of how to manage your period. So we decided what we would rather do is try and set up community spaces or tap into existing community spaces for women and basically get them making these toolkits themselves. So it was not so much about teaching them anything new or, um, you know, I guess, handing them things that they can use. It was more about enabling them to use the spaces they have as a community to support one another, to share knowledge and to build something they can use to manage their own periods. So when we were building this, we did like kind of research groups. We tested out prototypes with friends and, and with migrants and with people living in period poverty at the time. Um, and some of the challenges that we had to take into account was for those living in period poverty, everyone has a preference when it comes to what they use for their period. But we knew that we had to make something that was accessible for everyone because we don't know basically who will need them. And so we spoke to some women who told us that actually their cultural beliefs can dictate what they can and can't do during their menstrual cycle. And I think that varies from place to place. But that's one of the reasons that we didn't uh, end up going with uh, reusable menstrual cups, because uh, in some in some cultures and some religions, depending where you are in the world, internal um, sanitary products are frowned upon or aren't really used. So not everyone's comfortable using them. So the things we were taking into account, into account when designing this was um, people don't want to have to touch blood or, or necessarily have blood exposed. So there'd have to be some sort of packaging with it. We knew that there was a difference in cultural and, and religious beliefs. So being, being aware of those as much as we could to accommodate for them. Um, we realized that a lot of the time people don't always have education and don't have access to washing. So we wanted to try and build a solution that was frugal and that was ex kind of covered off all of the bases. Um, so our aim was to take action, to talk to more women, to start testing this, but we really wanted to make sure that it was reusable, that it was educational, that it was providing a safe space for women to talk about um, their needs and learn from one another and that it was universal so that no matter where you were in the world, you could use it. Um, so we were really fortunate enough to work with Engineers Without Borders Ireland and with Action Aid Nepal. Um, and we actually ended up going out to do uh, an action research trip where we worked with, I think it was six um, rural communities across different parts of Chirwan in, in Nepal. And what we did was just kind of introduce ourselves. We started um, the sessions and the working sessions we had with these women and girls by just asking them to share their problems. So sort of trying to create that safe space where I think a lot of these community groups exist and a lot of these women, I mean, the communities they have, they do depend on each other and they have this space anyway. I guess we were just opening it up to talk specifically about menstruation. And um, so we'd start by problem sharing, you know, how do you feel when you get your period? What do you find, like, how do you, like, what struggles do you have? And, and kind of sharing a little bit about that. We'd explain a little bit about what we were there to do. We had brought some materials um, and basically we're going to just do a workshop where we all made some of the pads together. Um, and so we started doing that. And it was really nice to see people adapting the designs, uh, adding more or less layers, depending on what they needed for their cycle, 
changing the sizes. And what was really great to see was, I mean, most people were much better at sewing than I was. So that wasn't, wasn't a problem. Um, but it was, it was really nice to see how everyone adapted the designs. We brought along some of the 3D printed washers that we have and we left them we left them with the women in communities so that they could use them. But what was really great to see was they actually started adapting even how they would make them. So they were taking old rice cookers to create the baskets. They were using old um, bottles to be able to, to rinse the water through them. And yeah, it was just really nice to see a space where you could share experience and where people were able to make um, make their own sanitary pads, design the way that they needed them. Um, and I think it was really nice to see the kind of discussions between the generations of women saying, you know, well, this is what I faced and now you have a chance to have something different, which is really cool. Um, and it was just nice to see people feeling a little bit more empowered to talk about their periods and, and, and their struggles. Um, yes, that is me with a pair of underwear on my head, so maybe it, it got a little bit too wild, but um, it was nice to see that I think <laughs> there is ways to tap into the resources, the communities and the, the materials that already exist um, and just helping kind of give people the space that they need to be able to feel like they can talk about some of these things. Um, so, yeah, that's what it is now. Unfortunately, because we were working with such remote communities, our lines of kind of communication feedback about how well that was implemented isn't great so we've heard bits of yes people are still using them and yes it's going well but we don't have as much kind of robust research evidence that we would like so we are hoping to continue kind of testing this and seeing in other places that we could implement it because I know I have a couple of friends of mine that still use it but um, it would be nice to kind of get it into other places as well so yeah the toolkit itself is reusable it's educational it's safe and it's universal and we hope to kind of be able to empower other communities to adapt it as well. So I'll stop there. This is so exciting. Yes, very good. I, I have another thing to say. Um, uh, two things. First of all, I want to thank Olivia. She's the first innovator in this space who has agreed to share the technology. Okay, there are a number of people, They, whenever I approach them, they are not willing to give me the details. So I think, Julieta, uh, with uh, Olivia, I, uh, I want to start a real um, uh, science project, I mean, action research project in the village, because there is such a, I don't know if it's periods poverty, but sanitation pads poverty. And uh, it is very interesting because uh, the women can design it. So I'm going to ask you a few questions on the design, uh, Olivia. Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, what was used in Nepal, this bamboo fleece? What was it? I mean, did so you find it there? We actually ended up just using, um, I think it was cottons. Uh, there was the fabric that you would use for... Um, almost like a, a tablecloth, but for like picnics. So it was a little bit thicker, but it was waterproof. And we used okay. um, a, a, a different type of fleece that was not bamboo fleece. It was something else. And it was just a an absorbent layer of fleece. Okay, so we can try. And how many times is it reusable? Because, you know, the washer, it seemed just putting it in water. First of all, in developing countries, water is contaminated. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, would you not need to wash it with soap? Then we usually used to put some disinfectant for reusable things, you know, wash it with Dettol, uh, hang it in the sun to dry. So I was wondering, how many times can it be reused? And how long does it take to dry? Yeah, that's a good question. In terms of how many times you can reuse, I guess it's hard to answer because we haven't done enough tests with specific materials to know exactly depending how often people use it or how much what they're washing it with or what they have accessible. So I think that depends on the type of materials you use and where you are. Um, the second part of the question was, sorry, what was the second part of the question? The second part, how long does it take to dry? Oh, yeah. So that depends. You can if you open it up, it'll dry quicker because so the way it's sewed is you sew the top, the top part and the bottom part of the three layers together. But they basically, if you look at it at the side, you can see through the different layers. So air can get into dry quicker than if you sewed it the whole way around. OK. Um, yeah. So it dries. I think, again, it depends on the wind, and the air and the sun. But we've had it that people, some people 
prefer to dry them when they're closed because it's more discreet and it's harder to know what it is. But I guess if you open it, it'll dry a bit quicker as well. So yeah, um, they're all variable, which isn't that such a helpful answer. Have you? No, it's very good. Have you? Do you use them yourself, or uh, are they a bit tough to use? Um, I use a mix, so it depends. Um, I think. So the way that they work is they fasten into the gusset of an underwear. So I, not all of my underwear have gussets. So if I have them on, I usually would wear them kind of in, in the nighttime if I, was in, if I was in the house. That's my preference. Um, but I think it depends on your preference, I suppose. Okay. Okay. And then do they, uh, do, what, is there any end of life waste material or is it all uh, biodegradable? I guess the plastic isn't. No, I would, yeah, I'd say it depends. If you're using natural materials, I imagine they'll start to degrade over time and you probably know when to stop using them. But um, the way that we were doing it in Nepal is they started to use old umbrellas. So they were kind of taking the life cycle from one material into another thing. That is very good. They were washed. But um, I think in terms of the sustainability of the materials in, individually, it, it depends what you're using. But yeah, the, the leak-proof layer, which is plastic, usually isn't that recyclable. Thank you. Uh, does anybody else have any questions? Okay, I think this is a, I mean, I would invite anybody, I've already got too many students to supervise for their master's dissertation, but anybody who does a, you know, knowledge, attitude, practice, uh, survey, develops it based on the scientific literature, for users, it would be, uh, it would be very interesting to use it with uh, a trial of Olivia's uh, product. Thank you. Thank you so much, Olivia. Now we have uh, also with us Dr. Rashi Tandon, who is a medical officer in Bareilly in India, and she's in the ex-servicemen contributory health scheme. Uh, with her interest in modern progressions of medicine, we invite her today to share her views on the challenges in health equity in SRHR and uh, the medical perspective on all that we've been talking about, the challenges that women in STEM face, uh, particularly with their periods. Thank you so much, Dr. Tandon, for coming in today and uh, the floor is yours. Dr. Tandon, you are muted. Ah, you have to unmute. Yeah. Is it okay now? Yeah. Good evening, everyone. It's evening here. So good evening. Um, thank you for having me here. Uh, I've not prepared anything as such. No, then we'll, uh, we will, if you're not prepared, you want to, because we had a most interesting discussion. Prachi, would you like to read out each question to her from the leading questions? Oh, for sure. We've, yeah. already, we've had a very nice discussion with Dr. Tandon, <laughs> and I think she is the perfect person to answer all of our questions. Um, so I have to ask you, how serious can the problems related to periods be, um, besides pain and all? Uh, actually, uh, in my experience, means I have been practicing for, uh, say, 20 years now. Whatever I have experienced, first thing uh, is uh, there is lots of ignorance about periods. Means, uh, <clears throat> like Akshata said, and uh, like uh, parents are not, parents, especially mothers, are not at all ready to talk to girls about it. For them, it's a taboo subject. And they come to us, they come to the doctors only when they are not able to conceive. That's one. Then if they are having uh, uh, severe pain, but that too uh, rarely because uh, uh, mothers have told them that if you take um, medicines for this, then maybe you are going to be infertile forever. So no medicines for this. And the pain you have to bear. And uh, um, so uh, it's a very taboo subject and uh, are using uh, these uh, sanitary products which are not hygienic, like uh, means most of them, they are using um, cloths, which they say they wash and reuse, but Kitna means how much this is uh, clean and all, it gives rise to many diseases because uh, they are not being washed properly, they are not being changed regularly. What 
means what i have seen is if they are having a scanty flow scanty means uh, not a normal flow if uh, the bleeding is less they they be they may be will be going on using that same pad for 3 days they don't even change it maybe they don't have access for more pads so they are trying to um, limit their usage so uh, they'll be using that same pad for 3 days so these are the basic problems we are uh, facing okay Uh, i have to ask you also have you seen any trends in help seeking have people become more aware or are these superstitions and stigma still very prevalent um it's um, it's improving a bit now but i won't say because it's common even in the educated lot mm mm-hmm. there are some myths there are some can you um, give us an example ma'am um, one thing is uh, not going out during periods not touching things if you uh, like <laughs> i don't know whether you have heard about it if you touch pickle during uh, menstruation that pickle will be spoiled <laughs> oh, i see yes it's very common so a female should not touch pickle during when she is menstruating <laughs> so uh, this is still prevalent even in the educated lot i'm not talking about uh, the the Means, the uneducated uh, lot. You're talking educated. about the educated lot. Ah, even the educated lot thinks about this. So Maybe I, it was another myth. The medical myth I liked is you were mentioning in the previous question. They think that if they take medicines for periods pain, they will become infertile. Yes. You, this is also with the educated yes. lot. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I have. Because, I think I have a question from Pierre also. Uh yes uh, thank you very much Prachi again to allow me to speak and uh, if I could be so free I would like to really echo uh what Dr Tendon has uh, has said this is especially the delay in the health seeking behavior across the spectrum of education is something we have seen uh across the the SRH SRHR spectrum uh also in in India um Dr Tendon I actually wanted what to ask What is ask- HR SR As sexual and reproductive and health, health rights. rights. I see. <laughs> Fancy words, uh, Doctor Tenden. So thanks again for your insights. I wanted to ask you, um, and especially since we also have uh, people who have some reach uh, with us today, whether you could share with us what are some of the consequences of. Um, improper menstrual hygiene practices that you may have seen in patients and especially in young patients and and how we could raise more awareness uh and and prevent uh, these things from happening yeah sure first thing what i as they have a myth that you using medicines during periods may give may lead to infertility actually their lack of hygiene gives rise to infertility because infection goes inside like i said they are using that same piece of cloth for 3 days so that infection is not going out anywhere it uh, travels in the genito urinary tract and it's infected I mean they are they will come to know that they are infertile once they get married or maybe they when they were whenever they want to have children so that they realize later on and then um, Uh, g- uh this um, genital system infections otherwise also not only infertility otherwise also local infections internal infections and um yes not uh, i'll i'll not say it's very common but then um, there are chances of having carcinoma also when untreated so that is uh, lack of hygiene only because they are not aware that they should that the area should be clean pads should be changed regularly or maybe not even that they should be using pads because according to them uh, cloth is a much safer option because that is washed thank you very much thank you so much and uh, i was also wondering since they've been uh, since these problems are becoming so widespread and also some other problem that a lot of people now are facing such as hormonal issues uh, 
like i think akshita also mentioned pcos adenomyosis endometriosis so there's a range of healthcare issues that causes something that it was in the survey everywhere period pain right i have two questions for you for that firstly why is it that these issues come about does it have to do with menstrual hygiene and management and secondly what is the way that they can be managed what is the best way to prevent them and to manage them um prachi actually there are two extreme um ends of one spectrum having scanty flow and genital infections that is due to poor hygiene and pcos like akshata said pcod is polycystic ovarian disease that is a hormonal disorder mm-hmm. that is more prevalent now because um uh, girls will not go for um, it's they eat very unhealthy food no exercise <laughs> i'm so sorry about it uh no exercise at all just sitting at home eating all the junk food and unnecessary unnecessary stress they are taking they don't have to take so much stress It, just for smaller things so that stress affects the hormonal profile which gives rise to pcos so that is m- maybe two levels of extremes in a spectrum one is lack of hygiene can you get me can you hear me yes yes we can yes. hear you we can hear you De- so um, what i have seen is um, that uh, means uh, poor social economic strata they mostly come with uh, uh, scanty flow during the periods that is m- most of the time it is due to the infection and unhygienic practices pra- uh, during menstruation and the other end is this um, pcod and um, that is uh, hormonal disturbances and they realize it when they have infertility before that according to them it's not a problem professor amani uh, moving to the uh, other end of the spectrum it seems to me that uh, heavy bleeding you know at the end of the at the end of the age cycle okay uh, is is becoming more and more prevalent so much so that hysterectomy is uh, or is becoming almost routine is it so or is it my imagination and are there any reasons why this is happening yes ma'am that's a very good question because there are two things uh, heavy bleeding uh, at the end of menstruation is a very common problem because again now there are hormonal disturbances so uh, we are uh, as you said hysterectomies are becoming more common because the things are diagnosed early one thing okay. second thing is no one is uh, means ready to wait for things to slow down <laughs> or naturally you just want to get over with <laughs> right so like we advise them that this is very common like when there is uh, there is a term minaki that when the when the girl starts her period that is minaki m e n a r k CHG even that time there are hormonal disturbances because body has just started the cycle so so many girls they come with heavy flow for days together then no periods at all for maybe 2 3 days so that is a that is body is trying to adapt to it and same happens when there is menopause when body is like trying to go away from it but then these are hormonal disturbances and you have to sometimes bear it i'm not saying that if you are bleeding heavily then you should just bear with it but then there are medicines and you can uh, like this see but no one is ready to wait now this is a very easy thing let's let, let uh, get away from this so one thing second is uh, fibroids are becoming very common yeah. which lead yeah. to uh heavy flow so yes uh, and that again is a lifestyle disease so uh, yes and i would say because they are diagnosed now so when they are diagnosed you don't want to live with them so they 
younger girls is the age also is there a age uh, when fibroids occur more or uh, any time ma'am no uh, fibroids are not commonly seen in young girls they are more uh, seen towards the end of uh, this okay. whole uh, towards menopause okay and not every time uh, fibroids lead to hysterectomy means not every time they are symptomatic okay Thank I think you. there are also new techniques to get rid of fibroids now with laser based ones right like and freezing them off and stuff if i'm not wrong mom it's not very much acceptable i mean um, uh, what do you say accessible accessible okay so that's the big challenge with it also so what this conversation has really allowed me to see is that with all of us is that between the age strata we see a number of problems and these only get Uh, and it, it's social economic strata also. Like you see a difference in the kind of experiences. So the diversity of problems that women face is just—it's enormous. Yes. Uh, I also invite uh, questions from our audience members right now and our participants. If we have anything for Dr. Tanvir. Okay. Then. Okay. Stay on, uh, Dr. Tanvir, because we'll come back later. But uh, no. now we are going to. So sorry. Yeah, let me just share my screen, and uh, there we go. Um, I invite now a leader in education, Dr. Julieta Marotta. She's the academic program director of the Master of Science in Public Policy and Human Development at the United Nations University. We're really excited to have her because not only is she an educator and somebody who is uh, really important for this discussion, but also uh, an expert in gender equity. She studied uh, gender issues and uh, legal empowerment in her PhD thesis. So thank you for joining us today, Dr. Marotta, and. Uh, Uh, we look forward to your thoughts. Thanks, Prachi, and thanks a lot for inviting me to this talk. I will start sharing the screen for a bit, and then I I will stop sharing. Um, because th and thanks for the introduction. Actually, um, I want to start the the presentation with an anecdote. So when Shyam invited me to this talk, um, and she gave the same context as Prachi was saying, well, because of your uh, expertise in gender issues and your previous studies. Uh, and she said, you, you will just need to talk about whatever comes to your mind, it will come naturally. And of course, via chat, I told Shema, yeah, of course I can do it. And in my mind, I was like, what am I going to say? And <laughs> I need to confess that I had very little information about how menstruation was connected to women's rights. And this is something that didn't come up in the research. So I, I have interviewed uh, victims of domestic violence and I have worked a lot with this matter and with access to justice. And even in the list of uh, subjects that Shyama asked me to prepare, there is one question about what is the relation with those women in the shelters. And I never heard women talking about menstruation and I never heard the judicial system considering the menstruation period. And in the conversations that we have at the university level, when we meet with the different um, schools uh, or with the different programs, and when we meet with the heads of the faculties, there is never a talk about uh, menstruation and how to uh, include how women feel about menstruation. Um, so I started thinking more deeply about, okay, what, what are we doing about this matter? And then I, I recall um, the thesis of a student uh, who I supervised some years ago, two years ago, and she presented a very, uh, very strong extreme case study about um, menstruation in Nepal, in a Chapaldi, where women needed to be recluded in these shelters while they were having their menstruation period because it was considered kind of like a scene going through that, uh, through menstruation. And what our previous speaker was talking about, all the hygiene problems that this was, that women were encountering and how sick they were getting. Um, with this in mind, I was continuing thinking, okay, what, what are we doing at an educational system? How, how are we incorporating menstruation that it's It's kind of like a, a wonder, I will say. It's part of our nature. And it's a wonder because it's something that allows us to um, procreate and to allow for the humanity to continue. And it's, it's a wonderful wonder <laughs> in that sense. And we have always been negating that. And that's why 
um, I have entitled the presentation what you see and what you do not see. And this is something that it's also related to the previous speakers. So out of desperation, I have a, I have a, a group of friends. Um, we are 12 friends that we started being friends since we are three years old and we did uh, primary school, secondary school, and we are still in contact. And of course we have a WhatsApp group and the WhatsApp group <laughs> is entitled Friends. So I sent them the question. I was like, hey, help me. Uh, what, what would you have expected from the educational institutions um, in relation for you to feel more comfortable during your menstruation period? And the first reaction was this, and I don't know if someone knows how to read Spanish, but you can easily see this emoticon. They were like, Juli, that's my name. I have no clue. I don't know what to say. And there I, I was, I stopped and I think I thought, and then with time, we started having a conversation. I went to sleep uh, in, with Argentina. We have a time difference of five hours. So I went to sleep and when I woke up, I had like 100 and something messages on that chat because the conversation started and there were lots of things occurring there. And one of the things, uh, one of my friends, she was saying, this is not only an interesting topic, but a needed topic to cover. And um, as I'm a qualitative research, I coded all that information. What I came to the conclusion is that it's not about what we see, it's about what we don't see. We see that there is a lot of improvements and that was backed up by the evidence that many of uh, that the previous speakers gave with the data about um, providing free sanitary pads to, to girls to allow them access to education. That's one of the aspects, access to being able to go to the school. And in some countries, uh, Shema was pointing into that in Argentina, it's the same. Some girls, they don't go to school because they cannot access to sanitary pads. And now there are being big campaigns and most, this is coming from companies, big companies providing free sanitary pads to, to girls. Um, it's also about having a clean space, like a good bathroom where girls can go and that you can sanitize and uh, you, you can get a proper hygiene. And here is where my friends were sharing a number of anecdotes. Um, one of my friends told me, it's also about, for example, the shadow, like the, the doors of the restroom, they need to go all the way down because I feel ashamed when I have to change and the shadow is showing that I'm changing and also the noise. Um, and these are things that I've never thought about that in an educational institute that you can have a proper space where one can actually uh, hygiene and then change and then clean uh, oneself and also have a uh, bidet. That's something that is very much into the Italian culture, into the, in Argentina, we also use them where you can sanitize, uh, where you can clean yourself with water and also providing the sanitary pads free of charge in these educational institutes because sometimes it happens that you are not expecting and all of a sudden you are having your period. And then uh, the school can help you in having these spaces where you can freely live that period. Not that if it happens unexpected, you know that you can count on uh, the school and you can count on the sanitary pads and you can count on a, on a good toilet or a restroom where you can clean yourself and you can feel comfortable again. And the other element, and it's related to the first presentations where you were pointing into how this is not only about the natural bleeding and, and protecting yourself of not getting dirt, or, but it's also about all the hormonal changes that a woman goes through. And I'm, I was amazed to read, and I learned this with time with also my colleagues at work, how much these hormonal changes affect the the psyches of women and how much we make a huge effort to annul them. And this makes me think about the right of women and where, where we are placing and how much we have advanced on this. We have advanced a lot. We are now in the market competing with men. We are trying to get the same positions. We are working at the same rhythm. Um, and we are annulling our, our differences. And one of the things that make us different is this period. This period that makes us feel tired, this period that people feel depressed, people that it's it's just part of our nature. And there is no space, there's no space in the educational design to allow for those timing. We have sometimes a different uh, timing where we need our space to actually 
deal with nature. And this is part of nature. It's not something that we choose. It's nature. I have a colleague here at work that after years of feeling very sick, um, she got into a good doctor who did a hormonal test and she said, it's part of your period. It's part of your cycle. During this time, you cannot perform and you need X amount of hours to be lying on bed because your body is requesting this from you. And there is now people are more open to talk about that. But for a woman, it's it's very stressful because we don't want to lose out. We don't want to say, hey, I, I'm not coming today to this meeting because I'm not feeling well. There is no space for that. And I'm not criticizing the system because I don't have a solution to it. I know that the, that the that production needs to keep on going, education needs to keep on going. But I know that this comes as a risk, and the risk is that we are annulling the differences and we are annulling the, what nature is calling us for. Nature is calling us sometimes to rest. Na nature is calling us sometimes to uh, have a headache and to need to deal with that headache. Uh, nature is calling us sometimes to bleed extensively to an extent that we can not uh, walk for a bit. And we are constantly annulling those needs. And here is where... I was stuck in the reflection and I was not understanding or not coming to a solution to it because of how the entire system is designed. What, what do we do at that educational level? Do we say, yes, we give you the chance to skip classes. That's okay, you can skip classes. But then what is the impact to your education? What is the impact when you go to work? Can you say, uh, suppose that you are part of the of Congress and you have uh, the most uh, important discussion and you are part of that and you want to voice yourself. What do you do? Do you say, hey, I'm having my period. Sorry, I cannot perform today. Or you take 1000 pills to try to be a little bit, uh, and I mean pills like paracetamol, like legal pills, but I mean, we, we tend to go to medicine to try to be able to perform as the others. Uh, and again, it's about this annulling uh, our nature. And it's, it's much more complex than, than what I was thinking at the beginning. So at, at the beginning, again, I thought this is quite like an anecdotal issue where, yeah, with toilets, with sanitary pads, uh, we can solve it with a paracetamol to get rid of our headaches. And then I understand that it's not the case. So in this element uh, where I was trying to brainstorm and have a system, I was I, I came to the conclusion that it's yes, it's about access to education. It's about providing the the needed uh, equipment, if we can say, like uh, sanitary pads, uh, good toilets, in order for people to be able to come to the school and to get educated. And it's also a, a matter of awareness. And I know that this word already came into the conversation a number of times, but I find two types of awareness. One is the social awareness uh, that we all need to be more knowledgeable and understanding what this means and what this means in terms of, again, something that it's part of nature. And I'm sure that others, uh, genders, they, they have other uh, specificities that you also, we need to also contemplate. But in terms of menstruation, those who menstruate, we need to be able to have a social awareness of what this means and that we are all uh, working towards including this uh, natural element of our lives into our social uh, performance. And the other one is all the self-awareness. I've seen that in, into the, the, the statistics that were presented and Prachi finished the previous talk with this. It's amazing how uh, the diversity of problems that we have. And this is also I saw in the chat of my friends, uh, some of us, we never experienced pain. So for me, menstruation has been nothing. Like I've, I've never experienced pain, so I could continue. And some others, they've, they lived it in such a um, drastic way and without any type of support. So this, the, the, we need to improve, I think, from the very early stage on this self-awareness, being able for a woman to understand what this cycle means and what this does to us and how it is connected to also our humor, our uh, stage, all the consequences that actually are produced are pro and provoked by the cycle. And also to understand that the, that the cycle is not linear. It's not that if you experience the cycle in this way when you are 12, you will experience it in this way when you are 40. This changes and it's also the education about what to do 
what with what you are experiencing with menstruation. And I think that the school has a lot of responsibility on that. Primarily early, early schools, like primary schools, to um, let uh, people who menstruate understand what is menstruation, what are the cycles, what are the impacts of these cycles, and, and to enhance self-awareness where lay girls who menstruate or people who menstruate can have a diary and make notes on what they are experiencing to understand themselves and to be able to make decisions. So this is this is a little bit the contribution. I think that there are these elements that are more uh, structural that we can easily fix if we have resources. And the other element that I think that is very, very complex, that is the, actually the welcoming of this wonder into the society and allowing us to be able to live it freely without needing to annul it in order to be able to participate in this uh, product productive chain of society. This was... Um, this, this was, was excellent. Yeah. Yes, absolutely, absolutely excellent. You know, so... Thanks. Uh, Prachi, you had a... Yeah, at the last uh, point that you raised about people now tracking their menstrual pain cycles and everything, we have more and more people, especially women in STEM, women innovators who are building applications like Flow and Clue and all of these different cycle management apps to so that you can track your cycles over the days and report it to your gynecologist or doctor, depending if you're going through any issues, which I think is a big contribution we're making as, uh, as women in STEM to our own health and well-being. So I think that also makes way for more inclusion and digital spaces to be able to discuss things. I saw that you communicated over WhatsApp with your with your friends, which I think is it's it's just great how uh, boundless we are. But uh, Prof, uh, first, uh, you know, I think I speak for everybody, and these were Prachi's words. We were absolutely mesmerized by your uh, talk, Julieta, and uh, thank you very much. Now, uh, first, I'm going to ask everybody to please uh, show themselves on camera for one minute for us to take a photo. Uh, Dr. Tandon, I'll need you to also come for a minute. Okay, so now that I have seen all of you, Prachi, Maria, Christina, Rita, okay, and uh, uh, Rita, Christina, if you're there, otherwise we say one, two, three, go. Okay, uh, Rita is saying she is not able to put on her video. Now, none of you are leaving. You know, I like to play my little trick. Okay, so none of you are leaving without saying a comment or asking a question to somebody else. So I'm going to first start with the gentleman who is not a doctorate here. Mr. Abhishek, you have come from FinTrust and you probably, have you ever talked about such things with your family? What did you get out of being here with us? Yes, ma'am. The first thing I like to say is my experience. Do you have to speak closer to the mic. We couldn't hear you. Okay, okay. okay. Now? Uh -huh. So I would also like to share my experience. Uh, in my school, uh, every time a session going on only for the girls, they never invite boys. Uh, I am wondering, I am al always wondering why they not invite us, what is going there. So this was, <laughs> you all guys are talking about this was problem from starting. If I uh, teach a child uh, this, this bottle is a weapon, then he will learn this is a weapon. So uh, every time in school they teach this is a taboo thing. So, in mind of uh, everyone, uh, this was fixed, this is a taboo thing. The second thing uh, I noticed and uh, understand, uh, I always thought like uh, it was a taboo thing only for the men. But uh, uh, some of the panelists uh, said that uh, uh, the mother all are also afraid to talk uh, with the girls about uh, uh, periods. So these are the things I noticed and uh, learned. And uh, one thing uh, I want to ask all, to all the panelists, so that uh, how as a man uh, we can 
केयर फॉर गर्ल्स एंड आवर अदर अदर फीमेल फ्रेंड्स सो एनी वन कैन एंसर प्लीज गो हेड प्लीज आई थिंक वी कैन टेक टर्म्स यू सी anybody you can all our panelists he said so all of you have got one one sentence each go ahead dr tanda you start i'm going by my screen then it's julieta you have to unmute you have to unmute <laughs> yeah i'm i'm here so yeah, yeah i think uh, one 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 of the main issue things to overcome is exactly the, the first example that you always you were saying that males were not invited to um one one of my friends who has a, a an adolescent as a, 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 a an adolescent she explained me the impact that it had at school of an event that occurred in where the um, it it was as um, a company came and provided sanitary pads to everyone girls and boys and they all left the the class and the mothers and the parents were outside waiting for the kids and they were like nine and they all left the class with the sanitary pads like this like waving them and the mothers were like what are they doing <laughs> and she said you cannot imagine the impact that this had for the for the group because then the girls when they were having their period they could go to the toilet with the sanitary pad like this and that this and it was not any more something that they needed to hide and the guys they were understanding that this was part of nature and that there was nothing wrong and they could check what it was about so this uh, helped a lot to naturalize the situation and look at how small it is no it's it's just an exercise of including also uh, males into the conversation and letting them be part of that and understanding what it is about because in the end uh, the cycle most of the times also involves someone else and this is when you were saying what what can we do we can do a lot in terms of uh, as a society in order in terms of accepting and understanding and also understanding that you are also part of that cycle you are not experiencing the cycle but you will experience the consequences of 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 that of that cycle so um, it's like you you are an, you are a needed partner in that cycle i'm not, i'm not only speaking about a uh, procreation this is one of the aspects but i'm also speaking about a partner when you are a colleague at work um in understanding when you are someone who makes decisions uh, in making sure that you have this into consideration and we are i'm including myself and we women need to include ourselves there because again we go into this tendency of annulling so much that we need to slowly try to incorporate this and try to just welcome these conversations and try to work it out to 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 make it to make inclusive decisions thank you thank you thank you dr tandan and then one quick answer from the rest of you also including uh, olivia akshita saimi i'll go in that uh, okay order after dr tandan i will just say start at home your sister your mother you realize when they are going through this just give them comfort when you connect with them you can connect with the other girls your friends your colleagues and whenever that p word is mentioned don't shy away yes that's it yes ma'am that's very good now there are there are heavy power cuts where abhishek is but still i'm so happy to have you and that was a great yes ma'am uh, uh, i also have one co i one more question for uh, tandan ma'am that uh, 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 i researched about periods how can i uh, help uh, girls uh, and my friends Uh, it was showing to that uh, the mood swings uh, uh, they are uh, allowing to uh, all the parents and uh, 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 girls also try to eat unhealthy foods like uh, chips and uh, uh, these things so i want to ask uh, these things are good for health or not good for health <laughs> you just said they are unhealthy things so uh, <laughs> this is confirmed that these are not good for things but you can indulge them just for two days in a month okay yes ma'am i'm going to negate what the doctor said and say that if if your if your family member is on her period get her the chocolate yes <laughs> i would say yes, that yes thank you olivia um i think something that i've realized happen is just i think when you're trying to be supportive not making it a joke so i've heard people 
blaming someone's bad humor on, well, that's just your period, um, whether it is or it isn't. And I think the shame that women internalize around their period isn't helped when men make jokes about it at, as a weakness or as a, um, you know, a, a kind of thing that makes them not able to do what they're doing properly, because I think most women do take it in their stride. And, and I think, um, as Julieta said, try to perform at the same level all, every time of the month though making it a joke doesn't help. It's not supportive. I'm ashamed to say we have made even jokes about other women when they are particularly crabby or say, oh, she must be, yeah. <laughs> you know. So, you very know, it is sort of, it, it's very bad. I won't ever do it again. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard, it is hard, but I think... Okay. Just... Akshita and Saimi, let's keep it short, but I want to hear you. Uh, yes, ma'am. So uh, I uh, only think of two ideas right now. First is that in India it happens that whenever uh, we have to buy a sanitary pad, uh, it is given in uh, black uh, poly bags yes. uh, so that it is not visible to everybody. So also it happens that uh, girls don't go and buy themselves. Yes. So I uh, and ask their fathers and brothers, uh, the mothers ask their husbands and the brothers for the sisters or even the husband. So I feel first what uh, men's can do is that uh, they should uh, tell their mothers or sisters that uh, you can buy them, you can show <laughs> it to the public. It is not a shameful uh, product. Uh, second thing which comes to my mind is uh, that whenever our mothers and uh, any sister is uh, having uh, her period uh, they can support in terms of helping in uh, some household activities if they're not able to do it they are uh, in pain or something uh, so yeah those two things came very out. good very good thank you thank you thank you saimi uh, yes okay so i i can just say that um uh, what i think that is the thing that uh, males can do in regards to periods is that um just listening and um, like recognizing the fact that even though you might not know a lot about it, um, the other person is going through something and you just need to listen and like um, like believe them if they uh, tell them, for example, that it is really painful or it, it is really hard. So just like respecting that and being empathetic and just oral listening. I think that's really important. Thank you. Thanks. I think Prachi also wanted to add uh, her bit to the advice. Yeah, I think something we forget about is that women are in the workplace with you at all times. Um, and we go through a different different energy cycles. You know, if you're going through a period, of energy might be low. If we're going through PMS, we might have our own, you know, issues going on, physical, mental, all sorts of issues. And men generally don't tend to experience that in such a cyclical way, right? Like they, their energy levels are they vein and go throughout the day. So in the morning, they're the same. Every day, they're the same. So that kind of consistency, if you see that with your colleagues, don't uh, uh, don't make them feel bad about it sometimes. I think that's uh, something you have to think about, that we're all going through a different thing. Now, uh, now we must wind up soon. So the thing is, instead of asking a question, I'm going to ask all the faces on the screen to Tell what you found most fascinating. What did you learn the most? And I start with Dr. Thomas. I Normally, Dr. Thomas, I thought, would have known everything there is to know about it because he's done his PhD on it. or He knows about it. So what did you get from this peer? What was, what's a... Uh, I, I stand corrected. There is still a lot that I need to learn. <laughs> and uh, I am more specialized in the in the little bugs uh, that, that come in, in, in trouble. So, um, but rather than that, uh, my take home message for today was just the uh, appeal to a more supportive and understanding environment. And I especially liked uh, um, the mention by uh, uh, Julia, was, was it her, uh, about just normalizing things and, and, and not making a big deal out of it. And I think that is a very important message to really start blending it and, 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 and categorizing it as a day-to-day -day activity that just happens and that we have to deal with with compassion and with understanding. So 
more than a scientific finding, I am taking with me a human message today. So thank you very much for having me over. Very nice. Then we have uh, Raji, uh, my sister, who is also with me in Finn. And uh, I invite her over. What's your takeaway, Raji? Good evening. Uh, I found the whole topic uh, very interestingly dealt. And uh, this is the first time I'm seeing uh, the boy and the men uh, attending this. I found, you know, girls who are 17, doctor, doctoral students and all speaking very nicely. I was really surprised by uh, Akshita also, who's an engineering student. And she had done, I mean, a lot of times in India, they are very... Uh, you know, they only talk about their subjects. And this is something different. And the very fact that Abhishek and Akshita were here. And that was very, very commendable for me. The doctor was fantastic. Each and every one of you did a very good job. I wanted to see the product that was introduced in Afghanistan. So everything, the little young girls from Maastricht school, I found the whole program very interesting. Thank, thank you. you. And thank I you. thank Shama for giving me the opportunity to listen. I, I, I'm very happy. Now, Rita, so you see, this is the first time we are talking about this kind of a sensitive issue. So I'm very happy. Uh, Rita wants to share. Rita, it doesn't matter if you cannot uh, show I your can, face. Please. I can say it as well. Yes, okay, please, sure. please. Yeah, sorry. Um, so it was actually very interesting to join. I joined a bit after, but um, it was also my experience that I grew up in an environment where it wasn't like spoken about. It's like when you're going to the bathroom, you really have to hide it very far away. Like no one needs to know or anything, but it was very insightful to hear that it's something we actually need to like speak more about and voice, you know? And I realized my biggest takeaway is I myself play a part in this awareness oh, wow. and it's something I can talk about and also educate people about and also get knowledge from myself as well so thank you guys very much for those that i heard uh for the insights the insightful um discussion very good point also very good point maria I, so much, uh, can, I can really echo the words of rita and um, i think i could really see myself in many of the stories and anecdotes i hear today uh, in, in Greece, I always also remember um, my family and my mother all, also trying to somehow, we were always trying to find other words in order to avoid the word period. Like we were saying, the Red Army is coming or something else, because it was, especially <laughs> when the men are in the room, we don't want to say this word. So I, I could really see myself and I realized that despite we have done many steps and we have developed in this field, the there's still a lot to be done and we should really start by ourselves. And we have this responsibility to also educate the others who are maybe not aware. So thank you so much. It was very informative and uh, I really enjoyed all the discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Adele, did you get something for your dissertation? Hi, everyone. Um, yes, thank you so much. It was also super interesting, but I think something that I also learned from um, from this conversation is still the stigma that there is around, um, around menstruation. And also now we try to design it around the stigma. So make sure that, like, for instance, the pads, you can just carry them like discreetly to the toilet. So I think one of my questions would be also like, how are we moving away from this stigma to make sure that we are all... Uh, talking openly about this topic as it's so important it in impact the health of women and girls across the entire world i think i think it's a slow process it's a it's a i'm just going to wind up so i'm taking the liberty but i'll just tell what happens in my family even you know when my daughter starts wanting when she's wanted to educate my son and my husband about these things and started talking about it at the dinner table they said TMI, TMI. And I said, what is TMI? They said, too much information, too much information. So we'll do anything for you. 
Divya, but please do not educate us more. We are educated enough on this. So I think it's a, you have to mix humor, you have to mix this, you have to, it's, it's not evident. And my takeaway is that, uh, you see, I thought I sort of knew, but you have given me so many good ideas. And that's why I'm actually very happy always to have these small meetings because I find what is fascinating is not only to hear the panelists, but to hear the audience. You know, it's it's very because you learn and it becomes very interactive. So, uh, you know, it is uh, I want to thank all of you and I let Prachi have the last word because uh, she's done a fantastic job moderating, <laughs> you know, and uh, uh, the the thing is, I, I hope uh, you will all come for our future events also. I'll be happy to send you uh, notices, OK, because it's really a conversation. It's not a seminar, question answer kind of thing. Please, Prachi. This has been a, a, a really cathartic and almost heartfelt conversation that we've had in yes. some way, right? Because we've discussed something that, that feels taboo to say. And now that we've actually have this platform to talk about it, it just feels like a big relief, right? In some way, because we all resonate experiences. We all see in the views of others, our own lives and experiences being shared in such a a very nice and actually intimate setting. So another thing I felt really nice about is that when one person is speaking, we're representing the views of so many others with Julia Tayur, with your with your friend group, with Saimi and Akshita about your surveys, and with doctor talking about so many patients and Olivia coming in with her experience with hundreds of women in uh, in in South Asia. So I think we we've kind of created a little bit of a knowledge hub on this topic today as well. So thank you so much, everybody, for coming and sharing your insights today. Thank you.